All right, we're going to try to surprise you with a couple of little tips on this engine swap thing. Of course, I know Johnson's put in 600,412 600, engines, but I bet I'm probably going to say something that he doesn't know during the midst of this presentation, right? All right. Before you pull it out and replace, you better find out what's going on. You better find out what burned it up. Like, for example, Let's say that somebody comes in and the engine's all cooked and it's burned up and then you got blown head gaskets and they got no compression and all this kind of thing, right? It's conceivable that you could drop that sucker in there, put them an engine in there, tighten every bolt, fill it up with oil, get it all bled out and everything, and drive it over here and they burn the sucker up again. Because you didn't find out they had an intermittent problem with the cooling fan. See what I'm saying? Last thing on your mind. You feel like you got all these bolts tied in, all this just right. Motor ran good, drove out well, but because of the particular way they were driving it, because the, you didn't check it out good. Rich. Yep. I had some happen like that yesterday. <clears throat> I put a motor in a Mel G. Yep. And uh, yesterday, and yep. uh, like when I was putting it back together, I found out what burned up the motor. What, what burned up the motor? You know where the air filter goes. Mm -hmm. A little rubber gasket that goes up under mm -hmm. the air liner. Mm -hmm. They forgot to put it on there and it was sucking dirt in there. It had yeah. dirt all in there. When you see place. dust, when you see a bunch of dust and dirt in the in, inside the uh, intake or going in through that in, in area of that hose, yeah, you'll work one up like that. And a lot of people have had to put power stroke diesels in there because they cracked the air filter and tried to fix it with duct tape and it sucked dirt in there. Just wipe it right on out. I'm talking about the air filter housing, you know, they bust it some, for some reason, try to get it off. But anyway, uh, what we're going to do here, you might mistake something else for an engine problem. Front end accessory drive concern. Belts and pulleys can sound like a rod, and I can tell you something else too. I knew of one time when they, they said, the engine's locked up, got it, so, sold an engine, and as they were taking the engine out, they saw that the water pump had come apart, and it was locked up, and that was what was keeping the motor from turning. It wasn't the engine. See, and so they had to fix the water pump, put it back in there. Fuel system concern, if you've got a lean condition, fuel filter pump engine control, if you cause a lean condition, it sounds like a mechanical engine knock. You can have a lot of carbon in the combustion chamber and it make an engine knock sound and, uh, and all that. So basically, if you've got an airflow concern, you've got a restricted air filter, it can cause a low power concern, it may be mistaken for worn piston rings or something like that. PCV problem can make it burn a wall. All right. Some PCV concerns cause the engine to burn oil and maybe even stake it for a concern with valve stem seals or piston ring. Now, valve stem seals are not something that means you need to replace the engine. We've actually taken on some of these Toyota Camrys and managed to put valve stem seals in those without pulling the cylinder head off because the parts and labor to replace the cylinder head gasket, pull the cylinder head off, valve job, put it back on to get rid of those, you know, the smoke. Whenever you crank one up after it's been sitting for a while, if it fills the parking lot up with smoke, we're talking about valve stem seals. We've actually fixed several of those. Uh, so, and I, I got a tool that I built for it over there. Anyway, uh, you got to use your basic diagnostic procedures and eliminate, identify the base engine as a root cause. Once you figured that out, you know, then you're good to go on changing the engine. But to start out with your least intrusive test and then move more toward intrusive testing as necessary. Sometimes you can look and tell what happened. Like if, for, for example, if you see where the thing is rusted a, a freeze plug out and it got rid of all of the coolant and they drove it until it melted down. Um, also, here's something else I'm going to say too that's really important for everybody to know is whenever you're working on, I knew this one guy that took a car to a dealership and I, I mean I'm not going to name the dealership but the simple fact is he took the car to the dealership for a uh, problem with the overheating. And he hadn't damaged the engine. He was, you know, told him, this engine's not running right. I mean, excuse me, it's not running right, but it's overheating too. He didn't even mention the not running right. But when the overheating problem was what the guy was supposed to be working on, the guy got caught up working on an engine skip that the guy wasn't even concerned about and spent like $500 of the guy's money fixing an engine skip without even addressing the overheating concern and the guy burned the car up on the way home. So he fixed the engine skip, but it didn't even address the overheating concern they first was really complaining about. See what I'm saying? So you've got to, instead of looking at what's important to you, you need to think about what's important to the customer because overheating is more important than an engine skip. Right? You got that? I mean, they're both important, but do your easy test first. 
use the results from the last test to drive your decision about which system or component to diagnose next. If a fuel pressure test indicates a potential fuel pressure concern, inspect the filter for a restriction before you pull the fuel tank. All right. That's just smart. So basically, you got to look for anything that you see that's obvious. Aftermarket or add-on modifications, damaged engine mounts, vacuum leaks, fluid leaks. You know, if a less intrusive test identifies a concern, repair the concern. And then continue, you know, then retest and see if you actually need the other. Don't need to be throwing an engine in there if they don't need it. Sometimes a component that's causing the concern may be a symptom of a larger concern. Now, we put an engine in that one vehicle out there. The reason I put that engine in that one vehicle is because it had been really, really hot. You know, that Jeep out there and those Jeeps, uh, inline six cylinders, love to have cracked heads and all kinds of other problems too. The one thing I didn't want was her coming back complaining about that. Radiator airflow. Inspect the radiator for bent or damaged fins. Other reasons the airflow may be restricted. Bring the engine up to operating temperature. Feel the heater core hoses. Make sure they're at both the same temperature. If they're not, the heater core may need to be replaced. But you also need to be thinking about the water pump. If the water pump impeller is eroded away, it may not be moving water through the heater core the right way. As the engine reasons operating temper, Temperature verify the coolant fan is operating, kicking off and on, off and on, and off and on. You remember, you put the also you hook your test light in series with the uh, coolant fan and turn the coolant fan through to see if the test light ever goes off. And then we talk about that in electrical. Uh, because a lot of the times, I've actually seen them where the coolant fan will kick on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off, and you have you say, no, there's no problem with this. And then the customer gets down to the red light, the can't, the fan don't come on, and the, the pop off on the air conditioner blows because it, it's like playing roulette. It stops on that one dark spot. And then it won't run. But every time it ran for it kicked on and off for you, it ran just really good every time. You gotta make doggone sure. And whenever you if you ever turn that fan through and you got a test light wire in series, it if that light ever goes off, that fan's junk. That's a go no go test. Alright, so you gotta look at restrictions, airflow in and out, points that can have air restrictions include induction system, exhaust system. Most restrictions should be identified with a visual inspection, but some need to be removed to be diagnosed. I was driving a 72 LTD one time, a fairly high mileage car, but it was in 1980 when I was driving this thing. And I went across the, you know, the, the you know, springs were kind of weak on this old car and everything. I went across this little railroad track down there at uh, on the Gulf Oil Refinery, and I gave it the gas really strong, and all of a sudden, all my power went away. And so I drove it on down to the place where I worked because I had some other work to do down there. And when I got through with the other work I had to do, I pulled it in the shop and was looking at it to see why it didn't have any power. It was like it just, you know, you know. And so I, what it turned out was the pipes on that car were laminated. And, on the, and they had gone over the railroad tracks and stuff and kind of flattened the bottom of them. And when I gave it the gas, there was enough exhaust going through there to where it, the inside of the pipes, the laminate, blew shut. It basically just blew the pipe shut. And the... I mean, when I finally dropped the exhaust loose and it ran normally, I, you know, saw the places where the pipes were flat on the bottom, and I cut those pieces out with a hacksaw, and you could see what was wrong. You know, it's kind of like an act like you've got a catalytic converter stopped up. Now, one time over here, when I first started teaching here, I stuck a potato up in the exhaust pipe on a car for a bug, and this one guy kept revving it up until it blew the potato out, and it went over there and hit that wall on the other side, and I said, I don't need to do that. <laughs> I like a potato cannon. <laughs> That thing just splattered on that wall over there. So I was like, wow, somebody was standing behind that and broke her leg. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> to diagnose induction system restrictions, look for collapsed hoses or air tubes or restricted air filter. This friend of mine was working on this Mustang, clean as a whistle, couldn't figure out why it wouldn't start. And whenever he finally decided to check the air filter, it was had 10 pounds of dirt in it. The guy had drove it into the drink and it had filled the air filter up with mud. And so his daddy wouldn't know that he'd been driving it in muddy crud. He washed it off really, really good. I mean, the engine was clean, the car was clean, everything was clean, but inside the air filter were packed slim full of 10 pounds of mud. And the car wouldn't start, you know, because it getting in the air, you know, that kind of thing. So we look for the obvious stuff, system restrictions. You know, you can look for collapsed tubes and, you know, you can look at engine vacuum to tell if your exhaust is stopped up. You can actually measure it with a temperature gun. That's not necessarily a go, no go. Get in front of the catalyst, behind the catalyst, you know, if you're in front of it and it's 480 degrees and behind it is 280 degrees, you can say, well, we probably got a clogged up catalyst. Sometimes, though, you'll have it cooler in the front than behind, like it's supposed to be, but you'll still have a bad catalyst. I've seen that before. Now, a lot of the times, the only way you can tell a 
definitively if the catalytic converter is bad is to pull the doggone thing off and look at it. But if you measure the pressure in front of it, and it's got more than one or two PSI when you rev it up, then you got a bad catalytic converter or something like that. Like that. Look at it burning or leaking oil. Is the leak a drip or a weep? Visual inspection, use UV with dye. It's pretty good stuff. That's a little, big old ugly thing like they used to have at the Ford place over there. All right, so this is basically them using the worldwide diagnostic system. Check to be sure the coolant's at the appropriate level in the degas bottle, which is that plastic jug over there. If it's at the correct level, check the coolant concentration. Make sure the thermostat's working. How can I use a scan tool to make sure the thermostat's working? Anybody What's know? The temperature. Look at the temperature. The temperature ought to go up, 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 then it ought to drop, then it ought to come back up, and it'll be fluctuating back and forth. It's about 195 and 205 or something like that. Uh, what temperature does the cooling fan usually come on? About two, two. I know on her car, like 208. Yeah. Well, on some of the GM cars, it does not supposed to come on until 228. Yeah, that's, that's pretty scary, isn't it? It's huh? Yeah, it's real high on some of them. A lot more, a lot higher than you think it'd be. Of course, if you're less than about 230 degrees, you're okay. And, I, you know, cars can get up to like 240. But when it, when it gets, starts to crack over 240, you better be shutting it down and finding out why the doggone thing's overheating. One time there was a uh, an Eagle medallion I was working on. It came in there and it was they said it was running hot. I mean, and it was running about 240 degrees, you know, bouncing right on that. And all I had to do to fix that car was replace the coolant. I had to drain the coolant, put fresh coolant in it. It was running normal temperature. I mean, so what? Like a, a lot of times, it's a simple thing, you know. I mean, I didn't have to replace any hard parts at all. Uh, Allow it to run for two minutes, record the voltage, record the ECT voltage every 60 seconds. When it changes direction or only changes slightly from the previous reading, record that as a thermostat opening voltage. But you can actually watch it happen if you've seen a scan tool. If the thermostat opening voltage is greater than 0.75 volt, less than 82 degrees Celsius, 180, put a new thermostat in it. If it's running too cold, you're not going to have it. It's not healthy for the engine. It's not healthy for the emissions. If an engine's running too cold, it'll sludge up. We don't want that. Okay, this is the worldwide diagnostic system. This was a, you know, a Ford uh, picture right here that I was talking about. Fuel pump operation with the keys turned on, fuel pump selected, the fuel pump runs for eight seconds. After the eight second, the fuel pressure should be specifications, up to spec and should remain within five PSI. Now what happens if it doesn't? What happens if my if I, my fuel pressure goes up and I stop and I shut off the fuel pump and then the fuel bleeds off? You got a bad injector or a I mean, but what kind of a problem will that cause? Um, Let's say that you got a shed valve. Huh? When you go to crank it, I have to prime up, but it'll take it a little while. Spin it. It's been too hard to crank. Like, here's another thing. There was a guy that brought this Thunderbird in there one time. It was nearly a new car. And he says, whenever I first got this car for a long time, you just breathe on the key and it start up. And he says, now i got to spin it for about 30 seconds before it'll start up. And he wasn't losing a lot of fuel pressure, really. But what he did have was three dripping injectors. One injector can drip and, and, and foul the plugs on the whole engine. You know what I mean? A lot of time you don't know that. Now, what I basically did on that one was whenever I pulled it out, and when I started it up, after it started, I shut it right back off and pulled the plugs, and three of them were kind of wet, and I pulled the fuel rail, and three of the injector tips were clean as a whistle. The rest of them were dirty like they're supposed to be. The ones that are leaking are clean as a whistle. If you had a real clean injector tip, you know, all that. All right, so ignition system checks. We'll use a tester to determine if all the cylinders are getting sparked. And use your scope or the analyzer, like, kind of like the one I got in there, uh, to identify ignition system concerns. Use the WDS to perform the ignition power balance, and this is a WDS thing. Like the worldwide diagnostic system is like IDS. This IDS computer we got in here that for Ford, you know. But you can use other whatever other tool you got, too. Uh, you need to have a light brown color on your spark plugs. They don't need to look like the ones Amber brought me the other day from her brother's truck because it looked like somebody had took a torch and heated them up and burned the end off them with a torch. It's hot enough in there. And you know how it umbrellas, the, she was talking about it, uh, turns the valve inside out like an umbrella that's flipped, you know. It is basically hammering and it's red hot. It's basically going to wind up, you know, getting to worry. It's a mess. I'd like to see that valve. Let's show some people that valve. You know what I'm saying? You take a picture of it or something, you know? Because I mean, I've seen those before. Like I told her, I usually see them on a boat. Yeah, let me bring it up here. Yeah, you bring the valve up here. So it just basically, as the, as the springs are slapping it shut, if it gets hot enough, it'll, you know, turn it inside out. Uh, oil contamination, carbon foul, glazed insulator. What if I got black soot all over my spark plug tip? What does that mean? It's burning oil. No, black soot. I'm talking about dry soot. Not greasy, just dry soot. It's not fire dry? Running rich on that cylinder. 
That's rich running. That's hydrocarbons. Now the greasiness, sometimes if a spark plug's been misfiring because the plug's actually bad, it'll have a greasy look to it. That doesn't mean you've got a problem in the cylinder. First thing you're going to do is throw, put a plug in there and see if it messes up again. Now, Amber, what I was telling, talking to you about the other day when you first came and said, you know, why do these plugs, you know, get to where they're looking like this? And they were, boy, they were ugly too. And I, the, there was a guy that was working with me that uh, had a uh, truck he was checking on an engine skip on it, number five cylinder, front one on the left side on that. And uh, he had uh, 160 pounds of compression on every cylinder except number five, and it was 120. And uh, because he had pulled a plug out, it was burned up, he put it in there, and come back two days later, burned up again. All right, and so whenever he got through with that, uh, turned out it needed a valve job to take care of that problem. Now, but because, see, if it's pulling air in there, you've got a lot of air going in there. It's like a dog on, you know, pulling the trigger on a torch. Makes a real mess out of it. Belts and pulleys. All the accessories all be rotated by hand in the unloaded condition. Take the belt off, rotate those pulleys, see what they feel like. If any of the uh, FEAD is what Ford calls front end accessory drive, it's your belts and pulleys. All right. Uh, if they don't rotate freely or they make a noise when they rotate, you've got to replace the component. What I'm getting you, by the way, uh, Harley, is the whole schmear. We're getting the, the timing belt, the water pump, all of the pulleys and tensioners, and even then it's like $165 or something like that. Just replace everything in there. You know, I don't think we got any problem with that. If the drive belt is outside of the installation, wear a range window and install a new drive belt. I mean, I'll tell you this. If you've got a belt tensioner, this bouncing, good possibility you need to put a belt tensioner on there because inside that belt tensioner is a little shoe that can wear out. And you remember you were working on that one the other day, the belt was just raising cane on it, like that. And it, somebody had put a belt on it, it was still raising cane. And it was bouncing. We put a belt tensioner on it, and we had to put another new belt, and it didn't squeal anymore. So a lot of times you may look at a belt tensioner and say, well, I don't know why it's bouncing, but it's, you know, there's some, but you put that belt tensioner on there, if you see one bouncing and you got any kind of an issue, you won't even think there's anything wrong with it because what's wrong with it is something you can't see. It's on the inside of the tensioner. i got a Gates video I can show you about that. But anyway, uh, drive belt rib cracking can occur at less than 96,000 kilometers, which is 60,000 miles in case you're left-handed. Uh, rib cracking cracks across the grooves, not a reason for concern. But as a matter of fact, they're saying if it's just got a few cracks on there, don't replace it. Well, I'm more worried about how the the pulley rides in those grooves and I am, you know, belt crack. But typically if you got belt crack, the belt needs to be replaced regardless of what this is. So look for water in the air filter in the intake. If somebody drives into the water and they drink some coolant, you remember how I told you it bent the rod on that Mustang on that other thing over there? Uh, you got to pull all your spark plugs out and rotate the engine by hand. Now sometimes if there's something wrong with the fuel system, like for example if the fuel pressure regulator's got a busted diaphragm in it and you turn on the uh, and a fuel pump pushes fuel past the fuel pressure regulator into the intake and it goes into the cylinders, you can have a hydraulic blocked on fuel. I've seen that before more than one time. And uh, the, this one boy that was working with me over there, uh, he basically, he was another drivability guy. I mean, I wasn't training him necessarily because he'd been in business a pretty good while. But he wasn't really familiar with Jeep Cherokees. And so he had a Jeep Cherokee that was hydraulic lock. You know, you spin it over and it, you know, you can't squeeze water or liquid of any kind or oil or whatever. So he goes to do that. He said, "Well, I got to pull the plugs out of this and get the gasoline out of the cylinders, you know, so I can, you know, get it started after replacing the fuel pressure regulator or whatever it was." So he pulls all the plugs out. He unplugged the wires going to the distributor, thinking he's killing the spark. Well, this one's got a crank sensor, so he's still got spark. And so when he spins it over, it lights off all of this gas that can blow it out of there, and it looks like it looks like an anti-aircraft gun out in the parking lot, getting get big balls of fiery gas squirting up in the air. Anyway, it didn't set anything on fire, but it scared the daylights out of him, I can tell you that. Uh, anyway, make sure you understand how that works. And what we do, like on some of those, uh, uh, the power stroke diesels and all that kind of stuff, you know, if you don't, like on the old 7.3s, if you didn't take those little plugs out and drain the oil rail, you know, blah, 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 you'd fill up the cylinder. But what I used to do, and this was sort of like when I was in a sort of a hurry, I would go ahead and just let the stuff gurgle down in there, and then I would bar the engine over and let it push it out of there. <laughs> you know? But you're still going to bleed your oil wheels when you're done. That's a diesel story. All right, the water of the fuel squirts out in the spark plug may have been damaged by the liquid in the cylinder. If you've got one, if you've got one, like I say, that when you crank it up, it's misfiring until it cleans up its act. And, uh, you know, you feel like, well, I want to see before I ever start it if i got issues. So you pull all the plugs out 
and then you put you a piece of paper or a rag or something like that, spin it over, and if it splatters a bunch of antifreeze out that hole, or if you look in there with a boroscope and you can see it, or if you got green, you know, green crusty deposits on the spark plug, you know, where the antifreeze has been in there, if it's you know green antifreeze, you can get orange stuff if you get the next or whatever. Severe hydraulic lock can destroy an engine. If you're not really, really careful. Stethoscope, identify the location of engine noise. We were doing that on this uh, Dodge. Fully convinced it's got a cracked flywheel uh, because of the noises it's making. As it's making rumbling noises too, but it's also got the tick, 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 tick that I hear when the flywheel's cracked. And so, uh, as soon as uh, just uh, then you might want to. Um, well, we got to get that oxygen sensor changed out. And Justin must have known how hard that was going to be, so he bailed on us today. <laughs> I could probably let Jonathan do it, but uh, he'd use a hammer, wouldn't he? Listen to the point one. <laughs> determine if the sound is coming from the top of the engine or the bottom, and determine if the sound is coming from the left or the right side of the engine. We had that one car that one time. It was the hardest noise to find that I've ever seen because you could touch the engine everywhere with the tip of the stethoscope and not hear a dadgum thing. But when you revved it up and let off, you'd hear something go like that. But if you screwed the end off the stethoscope and used it for a listening pipe, you heard it really loud in the oil pan area. And it turned out it was that balance shaft that was doing it, making that racket. And all that. that was like four hundred something dollars. Balance shafts has actually got the oil pump built into it, so you couldn't just get rid of it. You know, um, make sure all oil in the crankcase is the right viscosity and the correct level, and the battery is correctly charged. So you operate it till the engine is at normal operating temperature when you're doing your compression check. Turn it off. Remove all the spark plugs at the throttle plates wide open. Do you do that when you're doing a compression test? Do you hold a throttle plate wide open? Most people don't. I've done it with the throttle plate closed. But you'll get better compression with a wide open throttle. All right. Install a compression gauge such as compression tester in the number one cylinder and start with that cylinder and work your way through all of them. Now you're supposed to have all the plugs out whenever you do a compression test, not just one. Unless you're kind of sure that you're just checking that one cylinder or whatever, but if you're going to do it the right way, pull all the plugs, check them, check it with the plugs out, and make sure that you kill the uh, fuel system so that it's not spraying fuel in there while you're doing your compression test, because that can skew your readings. You know what I'm saying? Put your auxiliary starter switch on there. Repeat the cylinder. Crank the engine. Same number of compression strokes. I like to go six. Whoa, 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 whoa. You know, let it bounce up. If your compression gauge is not holding. Uh, air, you need to replace that little Schrader valve, and it's a special one for a compression gauge. It's not one like you put in a tire. It looks like it, but it's a different thing. The indicated compression pressures are considered within the spec of the lowest reading of the cylinders when it's 70, the lowest one between 75% of the highest is what you're looking for. The lowest within 75% of the highest. You're going to do a percentage calculation there. If one or more of them reads low, put a little bit of oil on top of the piston. Uh, the low reading cylinder, repeat the compression pressure check. If the compression improves considerably, the piston ring is a problem. I did that one time on one that had no compression, and it was uh, working at the international place. It had no compression, it was a gas burner on like Lodestar 1600 or whatever. And I put oil in there and it went up to 180. But it wasn't rings. It was, it had, they had floated a valve and a push rod came off and it was laying down in the valley. So why did putting oil in there make the compression go to 180? Because, I mean, it takes up the gap where the air is. It does, but I mean, I had a valve that wasn't, didn't even have a push rod on it. An intake valve. The push rod had come off the intake valve and was laying in the valley. Had no compression on that cylinder because the intake valve wasn't open, but I put oil in there and went up to 180 PSI. Sealed it up. Huh? Sealed it up. The oil. You're not, you're not hearing me. Of course, what I'm starting, what I was going to say is the vacuum pulled the valve open and it trapped air. And then, you know, you know what I'm saying? And that's why they went up. But it fooled me into thinking I had a base engine problem on that one. Never saw that before. Didn't even know it could happen. You know? And, uh, all right, if compression doesn't improve, valves are sticking or seating incorrectly. Two adjacent cylinders indicate the low compression. The sport oil on each piston doesn't increase it. The head gasket's blown in between. You'll see that on these uh, right over there. You'll see, well, somewhere over here, I thought there was a picture of that. Guess not. I would have messed up on that one. Uh, engine oil or coolant in the cylinders could result from that condition. Uh, the leakage detector. We got a cylinder leakage detector, and there's actually a worksheet on how we're supposed to do a cylinder leakage test. Really important. 
insert it into the spark plug hole, piss it right up that dead center. You got to have it on top of that center, or you got to have the valves uh, both closed by looking at the rocker arm or something. Compression air to admit it. What happens if you don't have it at top dead center and it's part way down on the, uh, you know, on the power stroke? You put the air to it, it'll push it down, <laughs> and then it opens the valve. It'll confuse you. Once the combustion chamber is pressurized, you put the gauge. It'll tell you how much leakage it is. If you've got leakage, you take your piston pipe. You listen to the exhaust. You listen to the intake. You listen to the block. You listen everywhere it could possibly go, and then you'll kind of figure out where it's going. All right, always follow the shop manual before removing the engine, else you might be in a bind. There's always one of the guys putting an engine, you know, when I was talking to you all the other day, he actually started pulling the engine out of a Kia uh, Sportage, and when he got it unbolted and part of the way out of there, he found that it was impossible for it to come out. He was supposed to pull the whole thing, you know, and so that was a, you can actually get in that trouble. Uh, subsystems have got to be clean and in good order. Damaged components can cause additional engine failures. Cooling system, and take care of it. Uh, front and accessory drive, and make sure all the fluids are completely drained when you're pulling the engine in, before you're pulling it in and out, or a transmission drain, all the fluids out of it. Uh, transfer all the components, oil coolers can trap contaminants, so you're really supposed to replace the oil cooler. If the engine doesn't come with one, or if it's got a remote oil cooler, you're going to put an oil cooler on it. Smart way to do it, right? On older engines that use a remote mount engine oil cooler, the lines have got to be cleaned out too. You don't want any contamination in your new motor. And to prevent noise, vibration, and harshness concerns, make sure the mounts are aligned correctly and all the fasteners are torqued to specifications. Sometimes you've got to loosen the mounts and the exhaust system, rock the engine, let it find where it wants to be, like the hat thing the other day. Uh, use the align. You, if you line everything up and you mark it and put it right back where it was, you're a whole lot better off. Add the correct amount of oil to the crankcase, put an oil pressure gauge on it, disable the fuel supply, crank it in 15 second increments, allow 30 seconds cool down between. You're priming the system. I tell you what I like to do. I like to put grease in that oil pump because it'll give you a lot. I mean, it'll pick up oil a lot quicker uh, that way. I mean, it, it's not that it won't pick it up. Although I will tell you this, there were some Cadillacs that were given trouble years ago. They would park at a convenience store and they would go, go, go inside with the engine hot, come back out, crank it up, wouldn't have any oil pressure. And you know what Cadillac had them do? They had them put tw you know 20 quarts of oil in the engine, crank it up, which would force the oil pump to pick up a prime. And then you'd shut it off and drain it down until it had five quarts in it. That was the dealer approved procedure for getting the oil pressure back on in Cadillac that had an oil pump like one I just showed you. All right, so some temps of the vehicle, if you've got exhaust concerns, you better find those. If you've got a catalytic converter that's messed up, make sure of that. Add the right kind of coolant, fill the coolant system. This is the last slide I'm going to do, but I've always told everybody here filling the coolant system up is not like pouring water in a bucket. I don't know how many people have felt like, okay, it's full of coolant, and they drive it out of there without even making doggone sure that the fans are kicking on and off and the thermostat's open, and they wound up with it overheating on them. It's a bad idea. This one guy did it to his own vehicle, and I says, don't make sure that thing's full. So whenever he drove it out of here, he just was driving around the next day, and it tried to overheat, so he gets out and takes a radiator cap off like a ding-dong, and he gets hot water all over him, you know? And so, who left my Mac in the jeans truck? <laughs> Must have been Gene. I know it couldn't have been Jonathan. He always puts it back. Okay. All right. All right. Anybody got any questions or comments? Got anything to say for yourself and all that? I didn't mean to leave your bag. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. We'll go to lunch.